Oh. Right. I guess we could have uh, ended up writing it too. But I got more. I got more here. Friends, let's pray together, shall we? Our Father and our Heavenly King, it's our great joy to be in this place, to do so as those who are your called out ones, who gather and assemble together for Christian worship, to magnify the one who is indeed worthy of all praise. As we do so, therefore, this day, dear God, we ask for your help. We do not have within us what you require of us. And so give us what you require us to give to you. And as you do that, dear God, we will be quick to praise you for it, to acknowledge that we are always the receivers, and you are the one who is a giver of all things. We pray, Heavenly Father, throughout our service this very morning, that your name would be the one that is hallowed and focused on, that your name would be that which empowers us, that your spirit would be the one who moves and teaches us, that you, Heavenly Father, we get all the glory. Please encourage us to that end as your people. We pray through Christ. Amen. And to all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who are weak and frail and desire strength, to all who feel worthless and wonder if, if God even cares, to all who sin and need a Savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus the mighty friend of sinners, the ally of his enemies, the defender of the indefensible, the justifier of those who have no excuse left. We welcome you in Jesus' name. Let's stand together, shall we, friends, as we hear the word of God read from Psalm 103. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame and remembers that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field. For the wind passes over and is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness is righteousness to children's children to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. So bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion, bless the Lord, O my soul. Let's sing the praises of our Lord together. Who tells the sun to rise every morning? Colors the sky with the shades of his glory. Makes us with mercy and love. Jesus died. Comforts the widow, rise for injustice, and feels every sorrow, carries the pain of his children, Jesus does. We sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son, the praise to the Spirit living in us. I was a sinner, he saved me from who I was. That's what Jesus does. Who on 
understand the heart of a sinner showers his grace over all our mistakes. Has his blood, Jesus does. He sings a song of sweet forgiveness. Who stole the keys to hell and the grave? Has the power to save? Jesus does. We sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. The praise to the Spirit living in us. The power of the sinner to save me from who I was. That's what Jesus does. Friend. Oh, what a Savior! He's always been good, he's always been faithful. Came to my rescue, and I need him most. He saved my soul. Yes, he saved my soul. We sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. A praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. We sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. A praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. What a great truth that is that Jesus saves us. We're going to teach you a new song today called Made for More. That's exactly what Jesus Christ saves us for. We were made for more. More than living in our shame. Live, more than living in our sin. We were made to praise him. To live for him. To glorify him. To be blessed by him. And to live with him forever. So we're going to be singing... <clears throat> The first uh, verse and chorus twice. By all means, this church is amazing. I know you guys know how to catch on real quick. When you feel comfortable, do so join us. I know who I am Because I know who you are The cross of salvation Now I am chosen, free and forgiven. I have a future, and it's worth living. I was made to be tending and praying. Oh, man, right back to life. 
very good for God to, in his kindness throughout the scriptures, remind us who we are. I remember a pastor, brother of mine, when his children would go out as teenagers, and you know, parents always have something to say, you know, remember this, and watch out, and don't do, and he said he would look at his kids and just say, tonight, remember who you are. When you're out there in the world, you remember who you are. And you would sing a song, very much like we just did, here's what God did for me, Therefore, this is who I am. This is for who I am. Therefore, the one I'm seeking to reflect. So it's not a self-centered song when you think, well, this is what I'm made for. Look at me. No, no. It's look at me. Therefore, look at Jesus. Because that's the only reason I am who I am. So it's a great, great truth that we sung there. Again, our church family is getting busy. And that is a wonderful blessing now that it's fall and our ministry year has kicked off. And so a few of the updates for you. We have been trekking through the New Testament this year, and some of you are new, I know, and you say, why just the New Testament? Why not the whole Bible? The reality is that uh, we've tried that for a couple of years, to read the entire Bible together, and I know some of you are still doing that, but we said, could we do something that's even a little more manageable, something that we can bite off and we can chew, and together, we can be sure that we're doing this together. And so these New Covenant Scriptures, where we've been walking through, will begin on Monday in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll find ourselves at the end of the week in Paul's second letter to Timothy in chapter 2. There are some very familiar verses for you. You may not be able to know the address, which is not inspired, but you'll know the words themselves, which are. And so watch closely as you read through 1 Timothy and 2, the verses that are very familiar to you. We are beginning our next generation ministry today, and we're very thankful for that. Yes, we only have a few kids, and yes, every single one of them are just as valuable, whether there is one or whether there is 50. And yet, we still need some teachers. And to be really straight and frank with you, right now we only have four. This time last year, we had 12. And so we are still asking for folks to come to us and let us know if you'd like to help every couple of weeks. And frankly, uh, if you are a member of the church, this is important to you. This is a calling of yours to see that the next generation would know the Lord, that we would not be satisfied with our efforts towards them until, as Psalm 78 says, until they've set their hope in God. And so those of you who would not be doing that, please be praying that God would move others in our church family to stand up and to step up 
and to give some time, uh, as we say, every once in a while to our next generation or Sunday school. We have a number of weekly meetings. And I'm just going to run through them for you, but you just notice how, again, we have these many opportunities as a body of Christ here at Downsview to be able to love and serve and, and care and, and grow for each other. We begin Sunday mornings, as we just did at 9.30, with a, a Sunday school for adults just downstairs. We're always there, 9.30, every uh, Sunday morning. Wednesday mornings at 10.30, we have our prayer meeting here at the church. We sing together, we pray together, and we spend some time over the word. Wednesday evening now, gentlemen, this will be the second week that we just began. Uh, men meeting their Messiah, an opportunity for a men's discipleship group. We had a wonderful group last week, just a terrific time walking through the reality of the scripture. So that's Wednesday morning at 10.30, but then men particularly Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Then the next day, ladies. Jane Hallett is leading you through a study of the book of Jonah, Thursday nights at 7. And as we continue through the week, you'll just see these kind of opportunities. One of these opportunities that came to us last week was this little seminar that we put on called Discovering Downsview, or those people who are new to Downsview. We had 17 people here in the room. It's just fabulous. We we're here till almost 2 o'clock, folks. Uh, we had lots of questions, lots of conversations. If you were here last week at that seminar... And I said to you, there will be the outline and the notes. There's a lot of PowerPoint slides. And I think Adi Bayar said, could we have those in note form? And so they are there. If you haven't received one yet, um, they're on the Welcome Center. Just buy the gift bags for newcomers. So help yourself there. But it was really something for us to spend time together. Some folks had questions about baptism, some about church membership. The two key things that mark us off as Baptists within the Protestant circles, believers' baptism and local church congregational government. And then some folks who are just new to the church and just had some sense of what it is like to not only be a Baptist, but to particularly be a Downsview Baptist. I want to thank you for coming. We had all our pizza eaten up. We had our drinks together. We laughed together. It's a really good spirit. And those are just moments that you just feel like, you know, God is at work in this place. God's doing something in the midst of his people. So thanks for coming. One late announcement here that it'll be on the slide by next week, but on the 19th of October, so the Sunday after, is it actually the Sunday? What day of the week is October 19th? Somebody tell me. Which day is it? Saturday? So Saturday, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, we're going to have a church social evening together. Details are still coming together. Just keep in your mind that the Saturday after Thanksgiving, we've been talking about this for some time. And so Errol just handed this to me, which I'm really excited about. So we're going to have a, some kind of a social event that night, October the 19th. So do keep that date in mind. Every week or so, someone will ask me how they can give to the church. How does this actually work? Uh, since COVID, we've just simply left a plate on the back and a number of you will drop your kind offerings on there and you're welcome to continue to do that. You'll always have that opportunity, but I think it's over 70% of our givings now come in through Interact e-transfer. And so that allows you to be thoughtful and planning for that and consider how it is I can best worship the Lord. And so you can do that and you can just go to our church's website if you want the instructions at downsviewbaptistchurch.com just click on the little tab that says give, and a document will immediately come up, give you all the instructions there. If it's complicated or you can't quite figure it out, let myself know, and I will direct you to Emmy and Andre and some of the other folks who know uh, some of the details in terms of those finances there. The last announcement I want to encourage you to be praying for is this is a picture of what we called our Striving Together Premarital or Marriage Enrichment Group. Uh, you may remember a number of months ago, Pam and I did this for five weeks together with couples that were all from very different stages. And obviously, Jen and Alvin were married a couple of weeks ago, and we celebrated that this past Sunday. Uh, PJ and Hazel were getting their uh, marriage enriched, so obviously they're still here. We're still waiting on Akshaya and uh, Nancho there. But just last night, this couple, this is Conrad and Akshaya. Conrad is actually from my hometown in Thunder Bay. What did I say? See, you're on my mind, girl. See, see what I'm trying to make happen here? If I say it out loud, maybe it'll happen quicker. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure now. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We still got time this morning, so you just if you need a minute in the back. Or... Sorry. <laughs> see, they're eager to do it. But Conrad and Russia got married yesterday afternoon. 
or uh, yeah, was that afternoon? Yeah, four o'clock. I was doing the wedding, what do I know? Um, yesterday afternoon, Conrad's from my hometown and they attend Liberty Grace Church. Now, Liberty Grace Church is one of those mission churches that we help. It's still a church plant after 11 years down near the C&E grounds in Toronto. And I met them as I just happened to be preaching there one of the times. As you know, I serve as one of the elders there, and our church gives some support to them. And so they got married yesterday, a wonderful time, like 30 people were there from Thunder Bay, so really good folks uh, from my hometown. Um, but the reality is that as we were there, um, they were very kind to invite us to the day after gathering, which is later today. And I was telling the folks in Sunday school that if I tell you, there's sort of a day after party with the uh, wedding gang. And that's true. Now, the, the thing is, though, the day after party is at the Blue Jays game at 3 o'clock today. And the dad of the groom rented one of these luxury suites. And it's the last game of the entire regular season. So I'm booking out right after the end of the service today. <laughs> And just to be really straight up, I am going to the day after gathering and wanting to continue to talk to the folks, but I'm pretty excited to go to a Blue Jays game up in those luxury boxes. But um, the point is, please pray. Are you thinking of them, Conrad and Russia? Uh, they're married under the Lord. They had a wonderful time uh, there yesterday. But a lot of their family and friends are still seeking and searching for a genuine, authentic relationship with Christ. And the most proud moment, I think, of our night, eh, sweetheart? As soon as I look at Pam, I get choked up. <laughs> Conrad is not a public speaker. He was so nervous about giving his, you know, thank you for coming speech. And he was so nervous because at the end, he preached the gospel. And he called the people there to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, just as he did because of Russia, his wife. Now, I can relate to that because God used Pam and her dad to lead me to Christ. And there's this guy who was just so nervous and he just couldn't wait to, I got to preach the gospel. I've got to call these people to come to Christ. And it was just this beautiful God-centered Holy Spirit moment. And so I'm just, just pray for Conrad in Russia that the seeds of the Holy Spirit would plant and just be pleased to bring them to much fruition. All right, I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to continue to sing praises to our Lord. We're just going to sing the gospel. We just talked about and praise God that that was uh, shared at a wedding. The gospel needs to be shared at every moment, every moment you have with everyone you have. So this is the way we can sing it. Day he's come. 
One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the storm rolled away from the tomb. And he arose over death he had conquered. Now has ascended my Lord evermore. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him from rising again. song is crown him and that's exactly what we want to do we've been singing about what he's been doing for us here on earth and it's to make us realize and then turn our hearts and our eyes and our minds towards him and praise him for who he is <clears throat> Yeah. 
majesty, Lord of all, let every throne be born and fall, the King of kings, O come and all, the God who reigns forevermore. Oh, hey. Please concretely cement that truth in our hearts. Cause us, I pray, Heavenly Father, to revel in that truth, to enjoy the reality of it, to consider the far-reaching implications of it, that you have come into this world, that you would prostrate yourself, as it were, before your own Father. And you would come and you would live the life that we should have lived, and you would take our place on the cross to die the death that we have earned by ignoring you, by refusing to obey you. Cause us, dear God, to crown you afresh daily as we consider all that you have done for us and how worthy you are of receiving our praise. We ask, Heavenly Father, you would cause us to shine and reflect Christ, that the people who know us would come to know that we love and know Jesus, and that through us you'd be pleased to use your word to bring them into a love relationship with Christ as well. Hear our prayer, dear God, and honor your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Have your seats, friends. Well, there's a lot of ways to say thank you. A lot of things to say thank you for, and there's a lot of ways to say it. One of the ways is in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, when the Apostle Paul writes back to this church that he had the privilege of helping to establish, and he wrote back to them with this great word of encouragement that I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. That's a pretty sweeping statement. Paul says, when I think about your church, I remember your church. Everything that I remember causes me to give thanks to God. That doesn't mean that everything is perfect or everyone is doing everything they should. But he means when he thinks back on a church family, his heart is so easily gripped with gratitude that he actually begins his letter to them saying, listen, when I think of you guys, I just want you to know that it causes me to thank God for you. And when God recalls you to my mind, it's that very effect that it's easy for me to give gratitude. Jen and Alvin, as you know, celebrated their wedding amongst us last Sunday here at our church, something we have never done before and something I hope we can do more often. But as I was speaking with them this week, Alvin and Jen said they were just so thankful. Could we have the opportunity to come and return thanks 
to the church. So brother and sister, come on up and uh, give us your word, please. This is Jen's favorite thing to do, to stand in front of people and talk. Is that, was that what you're telling me? Sometimes. <laughs> good, good morning, church. God is good. And all the time. All right, so my wife and I. Your wife? Your wife? <laughs> we are so thankful to the almighty God for... Um, beginning our marital journey with us. And this morning, last Sunday, we received a um, couple of um, cards from Martin. So on our way home, my wife decided to open them and we saw great messages from the church family expressing their um, joy and wishing us well in our marital journey. And we were so touched and blessed also by the gift we received a lot of cash gifts also from the church we never expected. So I decided to, uh, we decided to ask pastor's permission to express our sincere gratitude to the entire church family for this honor. And we are so also grateful to pastor and his wife, Pam, for being with us throughout this, this journey since um, the proposal in February through he was constantly praying for us, praying with us, and asking about how preparations were going back home in Ghana. And there was so much concern about um, this journey. And we would like to say a very big thanks to Pastor and my wife, and also the all church family. We are so grateful to you for your support, for your prayers while we were away, and how you received us when we got back to Canada. We are so thankful and. We are happy to be a part of this family, and by the grace of God, I brought a, a new member. Yeah. <laughs> I brought a new member, and we are happy to, to, to be in Downsview Baptist. So God bless you all. I've said it all for the family. Thank you. <laughs> Make no mistake, Jen gets her share of words in there when it is required. So, <laughs> Good words, good words. The children can be dismissed for our Sunday school. They're just going to go through the back today. There's still a little bit of stuff we did here in terms of our renovations. But as they leave, would you pray with me, please? Fathers, our children are dismissed for this first class of our next generation ministry for this ministry year. I thank you, dear God, for using Tatiana and Diane to minister to these young lives. We certainly pray, Heavenly Father, it would be your kind intention now to use imperfect means to achieve your perfect ends. Would you, I pray, Heavenly Father, cause the truth of your word to penetrate these young hearts and that, Heavenly Father, you continue to work on them, work in them, work through them by your spirit until they have set their hope in God. In Christ's name, we ask these things. Amen. Some of you would have uh, received a, an outline on the way in uh, this morning, and you may find that helpful in the next little bit. We are going to return to a uh, talk, a sermon, on the issue of baptism. Understanding baptism here at Downsview Baptist Church. Now, when I was praying with the worship team beforehand, I said to them, like, why would we yet again come back to the subject of baptism? Nacho said, well, it's because we're a Baptist church. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Because that's often the very reason that we don't come back to it. Because we are a Baptist church. We've talked about this before. This is my eighth fall season beginning at the church. And I think I've spoken on baptism seven different times. So almost once a year. And many folks are thinking, I haven't seen you audibly sigh, but I can feel some of you in your heart. You're going, really? Like baptism? Like you don't think we've got this by now? Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, you need you to understand something. I feel like I need to say sorry to a church family. I say it not just from myself, but from many, many brother pastors 
because I really do believe that in the last 30 to 50 years, the Baptistic evangelical churches have done a very poor job of explaining to you what the Bible says baptism is and what we are called to do. We spent, as a denomination, about five years ago, we spent three full years crocking, uh, walking across our country from B.C. to Newfoundland discussing the issue of baptism amongst our fellowship of evangelical Baptist churches. Like Baptist churches that have to spend three years as a denomination to see do we actually understand what this is and do we all agree? And frankly, we didn't even all agree at the end of that time. And there is, there is something that has to be said about the reality of this concept, this truth, this call for obedience, this work of the Holy Spirit that he moves us to take part in that we've just not done a very good job because confusion continues to reign about what baptism is. And so there's many folks that I've been praying for by name, with their mind, my mind's eye this week leading up to this, who claim to be disciples and who have yet to walk through the waters of baptism with Christ. And I'm praying for specific people like that this morning. I'm praying for people specifically that they would find themselves prompted by the Spirit to enjoy the Lord, to find the joy that there is in this beautiful act of obedience. But I'm also praying for the rest of us, perhaps who have been baptized for some time, that we would be equipped to better understand baptism and better help others to understand baptism. That at Downsview Baptist Church, it would be crystal clear what the Lord Jesus has laid out through his spirit, even through his servants in the scriptures, what exactly he's calling us to. So it's not just for those who aren't baptized. Pray for them. Think about them. Some of you know who those people are in the room. But also pray for one another. That we would understand how to explain this even better and in a more biblical way. So I said to you, friends, I, I believe as a pastor of the church that we still have at least two areas of profound confusion, of misunderstanding of what baptism is. There are people in this room with us today who believe this statement. I don't need to be baptized because I was baptized as a baby. Now, again, I'm taking responsibility for that. I'm the one at the pulpit here. It's me and my brother pastors. We have not done a good job at helping people in this room understand, well, I was baptized as a baby. What, what are we talking about this whole believer's baptism? There's still confusion. And some of you are going, come on, people understand that. No, they don't. We need to address this over again so that by no fault of their own, they would, they're already confused, but now we can help them with some clarity. The number one is that people still believe I was baptized as a baby. I don't need to be baptized as a believer. The second confusion is this. Baptism is not a salvation issue. By that, we have come to mean, and I have said many times, well, baptism is not an issue of your salvation. It's just something that comes on the other side of it. And it ends up being pushed into the dusty corner of Christian interest, but not Christian obedience. That baptism has nothing to do with my position before the Lord. That is not only just wrong and a fallacy, it is an anti-gospel statement that baptism has nothing to do with my salvation. Those two profound misunderstandings, I hope to some degree to remedy. But you see, the third thing that's going to happen here this morning, if we're not careful, is this is what we also believe. Everyone already knows what it means to be baptized. Pastor, you said it yourself. You preached on it almost once a year. Everybody already knows this. And by the way, no one needs to be reminded Right? Friends, the Bible is replete with repeat 
of things we already know or assumes we already have had the opportunity to know and yet tells us all over again. Read through your Old Testament scriptures. There's an entire book, Deutero, Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law. The, the very name of the book is I'm going to repeat myself, God says. How many times would you read through? And God said to Moses, and he likes, writes what he says to Moses, go tell the people. And then the next part, it says exactly what God just told me. It repeats itself. In fact, friends, 2 Peter chapter 1 says, I intend to remind you of these things, even though you know them, even though you are established in them. That's how the Bible talks about things that we already know. Friends, not everyone gets this. Not everyone's been here every year for seven years. Not everyone's been in that service that we talked about baptism. Not everyone has left with the clear even understanding of it. Brothers and sisters, a Baptist church must be sure that we understand this beautiful call of obedience from the Lord Jesus Christ upon us as his disciples, as believers in, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's begin with this. Now oh, that's my thumbs down and we've not done a good job. Let's begin with the foundation scripture. So take your Bibles and please turn to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John chapter 14. John's Gospel in chapter 14 is on page 901 or on page 1071 in your pew Bibles. John's Gospel chapter 14. I'm doing this because I don't want to begin with just a concept or a systematic approach to this. We need to be sure that we're anchored in the scriptures. My conviction is when we are anchored there, we will find ourselves in a solid, steadfast place. So from chapter 14, verse 15, I will read to the end of verse 31. You may remain seated, but please give due attention to the word of God. Jesus Christ says to his disciples the night before he died on their behalf. Verse 15, chapter 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I'll come to you. Yet in a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Verse 20. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you'll be manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the words that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Now, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. 
You heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father. But the Father is greater than I. And now I've told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. Verse 30 says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father commanded me, so that the Father may know that I, and the world may know that I love the Father. Let us go, rise, let us go from here. The Lord Jesus lays out the night before he died, words of comfort and encouragement to his people. Now remember, the book of John, the gospel of John, has this explicit purpose in mind. Right at the end of it, so we read the entire book through this grid, if you will, that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The purpose of the Gospel of John is that the things that are written down would show you who Jesus is, that you'd believe it, and in believing, you would have life in his name. Let me give you five, five premises that walk through this passage that we've written. The first one is this. Premise number one, to have life in his name is to be saved. Yes? Are you tracking with me then? You may have life in his name is another way of saying you're in a right relationship with God or you're saved. Okay. Premise number two, to love Jesus is to be saved. You agree with that? So to have life in his name that's one way to say it. To love Jesus is another way to say it. In chapter 14 and verse 20, that's what we read. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. Having the love of the Son, having the love of the Father on you means you're saved. Agreed? Premise number, or let me, let me sum that up. Then to be saved is to love Jesus. Or to love Jesus is to be saved. Those are the same things. Agreed? Okay, here's the third premise. To love Jesus is to keep his word. Yes? That's what it says in chapter 14 and verse 15. Three times. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Please don't read it the way I read this verse for years. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's not what it, there's no command there. It's a statement of fact. This is how it is. People who love me keep my commands. Right? It says it a, third, a second way. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Loving Jesus means I keep his commands. Third way. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. The diagnostic of whether or not you and I are saved meaning we're someone who loves Jesus, someone who has life in his name, the diagnostic of that is, do I keep his word? Agreed? That's our third premise. Here's the fourth premise. To refuse to keep his word is to refuse to love Jesus. That might sound a little harsh to you, but are you with me? If I keep his word, I show I love him. Refuse to keep his word shows I don't love him. That's how he says it. Three ways positively. This is the fourth one negatively. Chapter 14 and verse 24. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Jesus, very clear. No? Here's the fifth premise. We can only be assured that we love Jesus if we keep his word. Agreed? That's how you know. That's how you can be assured. That's the only basis for giving assurance to another. If you keep his word, you can be assured that you love Jesus. So, in summary, people who have life in his name are saved. That's John chapter 20 that we read. People who have life in his name are saved. 
people who are saved are people who love Jesus. And people who love Jesus are people who keep his word. Okay? Again, I don't always have to make these little asides. It doesn't say, if you keep his word, you'll cause him to love you. That's not what he said. Just a statement of fact. People who love Jesus are people who keep his word. People who keep his word are people who show they love Jesus. People who love Jesus are people who are saved. People who are saved have life in his name. Good? So that's our foundation text. Here's our foundation topic. Because here's how now we apply that issue of what word of Jesus do we keep? Because I could just as easily at this point pivot to service in the body of Christ. If any man has a gift of serve, serve. Right? I could pivot to giving financially to the church. It's 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 would tell us we're called to do. This could be husbands, love your wife as Christ loves the church. This could be parents, raise your children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Right? There's other areas to apply these words, but the application, the foundation topic, is the topic of believer's baptism. So let me take these truths and apply them here. A couple of questions. Is baptism a salvation issue? You don't have to answer out loud, but answer honestly in your heart. What do you think? What do you want to say? What, do you, what kind of feels right? Think so, but often it feels like this. Since we're saved by faith and not by works, a refusal to be baptized doesn't affect a person's salvation. You can see the logic there. Therefore, it doesn't matter if we are baptized, we're still saved. Some of you think that right now. And some of you have heard preachers like me say things that are very close to that. You may not agree with that. You may be tending towards that. Let me ask it slightly differently. Not is baptism a salvation issue. Is obedience a salvation issue? Okay, let's think about the logic this way. Since we're saved by faith and not by works, refusal to obey Jesus doesn't impact a person's salvation. Getting a little uncomfortable? I hope so. Because the therefore is I can ignore the commands of Jesus and still be certain of my salvation. It's sounding a little less true, isn't it? Let's try another one. That essentially I can be a follower of Christ without following Christ. That's weird. But... If obedience is not a salvation issue, then maybe this is the conclusion we come to. Let me try a third one. Is obedience in baptism a command of Jesus? Tell me, yes or no. Is it? Yes? Who thinks no? Okay, so obedience in baptism, is it a command of Jesus? I think we're saying yes. Jesus is commanding us to do that. Okay, of course it is. Of course it is. We know Jesus has called his church to do this, and we'll look at the text for that in a minute. But here's the logic. Since obedience to Jesus' commandments is an indication of love for Jesus, which we've already established, right? Obeying Jesus' commandments is an indication of my love for Jesus. Is loving Jesus a salvation issue? Please say amen to that. We got to back up. <laughs> Loving Jesus is a salvation issue. Then is baptism a salvation issue? Did you see how one thing is building on the next? Can you ignore Jesus' commands and expect to be granted life in his name? No, of course not. And yet somehow we've got there with the issue of baptism, haven't we? Because baptism is not a salvation issue I have said, and many of you have thought, some of you may still be thinking that, and I'm, I'm not beating up on you. I'm taking the blame. We're trying to fix that. So is there a scriptural pattern in terms of baptism in the life of the believers of people? 
of, of God's people. There is. So got your Bibles open. Look back, look forward, excuse me, to the book of Acts. Just the next book over from John, chapter 16. We want to establish a scriptural pattern here. Chapter 16, verse 25. This is a different example than we used last time, and we're doing that on purpose. So we got our foundation text and our foundation topic. Now we're saying, is there a scriptural pattern that we're called to follow? Well, here's Paul and Silas who've been preaching the gospel, who've been thrown into jail because of it. Chapter 16 of the book of Acts in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's bonds were unfastened. Now when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Verse 28. But Paul cried out in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, we are all here. And the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Hallelujah. A great story. Well, what's the pattern? Let's look. The first thing we see is the preaching of the good news. Paul and Silas were preaching the gospel. Paul and Silas lay out the gospel to this jailer as he asks about it. He says there in verse 31, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Your whole household, everyone in your house who believes, you'll be saved. Good news is preached, right? Right? What did the preaching of the good news include? What do we know? It's not explicit in the text. The preaching of the good news had to include what? He was baptized at once, he and all his family. Where did he get that idea? He's some Roman jailer. He doesn't know about this stuff. This is new early days of the church. Every expectation and insinuation there is that Paul and Silas preach within the good news a call to be marked by baptism. So the preaching of the gospel included a call to be baptized. That's how he knows, and that's what he shows. He rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. It's a great story, great story. Here's the pattern. Bible, belief, baptism. Yes? Preaching of the gospel, belief in the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, subsequent action, baptized. And don't miss the last one. Bible, belief, baptism, what? Rejoicing, right? He rejoices. Chapter 16 and verse 34, he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. This belief in God causes him to rejoice. That belief, that commitment to Christ, the kind of thing we've been singing about, rejoicing in ourselves here already this morning. So, what's the pattern? Authentic belief comes from authentic preaching. These guys are already in jail for preaching the gospel. They're singing hymns. This earthquake happens. They don't look to save themselves. They look to save spiritually a man who thinks he should just run himself through because he's going to be killed. They're concerned about other folks. There's real authentic preaching, sacrificial preaching, an opportunity for them to be sure that the word gets out. That's what authentic preaching must be. That's what we must never negotiate from this church. We must set or see that people get what they require in order to believe. That's what authentic preaching is. That's what real, honest Bible preaching is. No half measures. 
No rounding off the tough edges of the gospel. No failing to talk about sin. No refusals to call people to commitment, to change, to correction, including the pastor, who I'm saying we're trying to correct many years of wrong teaching about baptism. No half measures. We preach the gospel. One way is God, man, Christ response. There is a God, holy and majestic, high and lifted up, wholly transcendent, apart from us, who's been pleased to create a universe, to create an earth, to create people like us, to do so in his own image, calling us to see him for his glory and to worship him. And secondly, man, when we got that revelation, well, we didn't receive it. We rejected it. We don't care about God. We want to set our own course. We will not acknowledge him as the one who is supremely worthy of our worship. We want that ourselves. We'll not ask him to be the one who leads and guides us. We will set our own course, thank you very much. We're not interested in his rules or regulations or the way we should be called to live. We will decide that for ourselves. So thirdly, Christ. God himself sends the Lord Jesus Christ into this world. God the Son and the Son of God perfectly keeping the law of God that we were called to, perfectly paying for my sin because that's what I earned. But he took it on himself on the cross, rising on the third day in vindication of all of his claims to to deity, interceding for us even now as our great high priest above. And this Christ who would do all of this for us then calls us to fourthly a response that we surrender to him, that we bow our knees before him. We say, I'm so sorry. I have no excuse. Please forgive me. Cause me to surrender. I give up. I give up. I wave the white flag. You are my Lord. You are the only Savior. Please help me. Save me. I'm calling on you to save me, dear God. Forgive me. I am yours. Save me. That, brothers and sisters, is what must be preached from this pulpit. It was preached throughout the New Testament, especially in these early days of the book of Acts. That was the pattern. Authentic preaching brings authentic belief. Authentic belief, then, leads to accompanying behavior. It doesn't just say, I believe, and it doesn't matter how I live. It's only by faith. It doesn't matter if I operate out of that. No, no. Every time. Authentic belief leads to accompanying behavior. That means we see that people understand not just what they need to believe to be saved, but what is now required of them as saved people. That's what we do. That decision leads to a demonstration that that decision is real. That acceptance of Christ actually leads to subsequent activity to honor Christ. That my belief always equals authentic behavior before the Lord. And what's the last one? Accompanying behavior yields joy every time. Obedience equals blessing. Not the other way around. Bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. Show me that you're worth it. Give me this terrific life, and then I'll consider offering offering myself to you as your subject. No, no. No, no, obedience comes after, or obedience is that blessing is going to follow the obedience. The obedience comes first. If he is my Lord, he's only my Savior because he is my Lord. That the rejoicing and the blessings come on the other side of my obedience. Well, that's the scriptural pattern. Want to see it throughout the scriptures? Now, this is on your outline. I'm going to go quickly. But watch how many times through the book of Acts. Chapter 2 and verse 36, after Pentecost, those who received his word were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Just so obvious. Luke, the writer of the book of Acts here, just keeps going. People received his word and they were baptized. When Philip is preaching in Acts chapter 8, when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. When they believed, they were baptized. Just as subsequent. Chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is there, having regained his sight after his encounter with Christ in the road to Emmaus. You may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a believer. That's someone who's right with God. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight. And what? 
He preached. He went to church. He thought about this for a while. He went to Bible college. No, immediately he was baptized. Belief, baptism. Acts chapter 16, where the church in Philippi was about to be established through the ministry of this lady, Lydia, dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira. It says the Lord opened her heart. Again, another way to speak about having life in his name. God opened her heart to pay attention to the things that were said by Paul. And after she was baptized, her whole household who came to believe as well, saying, if you judge me faithful to the Lord, Another way to say, I'm right with God. Come and stay at my house and establish his church. That would be the church at Philippi. Acts chapter 18, the Corinthian church. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, what? They believed and they were baptized. Chapter 19, and when he said, into what name were you baptized? You know what's going on here? This is the disciples of John the baptizer. Not John the Presbyterian. John the Baptist, he's ours. He's doing this ministry, and apparently these disciples trusted the truth of what John was preaching about Jesus, but then before Jesus shows up, they left. They missed him, and God in his sovereign purposes brings them together, and they are unbaptized believers. You've been having a baptism of repentance, but not a baptism as believers. And Paul says, into what baptism were you baptized? They said, well, into John's baptism. Paul said, well, he baptized with a baptism of repentance or preparation. Be ready, right? Make yourselves ready. The kingdom of God is at hand. Instead, Paul, after hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You never again in the entire New Testament see an unbaptized believer. From Acts chapter 19 forward, all of the narrative accounts, belief, baptism again and again and again and sometimes acts is a transitional book it's a little tricky to understand but here even in chapter 22 paul is saying here rise and wa be washed be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name there's a calling on his name to be saved that's what in fact baptism actually says which we're going to see in just a moment but those are the scriptural uh, examples that's the pattern in Acts 16 that we worked through, and it's in all those passages, there's an ongoing scriptural pattern. So what practical details are there? We're here at Downsview Baptist Church. What does it mean to be baptized? Or what does baptism look like at Downsview Baptist? Here's probably a better question. What does baptism look like in your life? Because you don't need to understand a policy position at, ba at Beth, uh, Downsview Baptist Church. You do. But you need to understand what's happening in your heart and mind. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit is convicting joyfully the comfortable right now and is comforting those who are feeling that conviction. What does baptism actually look like in your life? Well, here's what it looks like here. Three questions. What does baptism show, says, and how does baptism save? Let me go relatively quickly. Again, this is all in your outline. What does baptism show? It shows I've waved the right flag. I surrender. I give. I'm not fighting you anymore, Lord Jesus. I'm not resisting anymore. You've been calling and drawing me to yourself. You've called all men everywhere to repent. You've called me to come unto you, all who are weary laden, and I will give you rest. I give, I surrender, is what baptism shows. Bobby Jameson, one of the associate pastors at Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., Puts it this way, baptism shows, number one, a church's act of affirming and portraying a believer's union with Christ by immersing him or her in water. That's the church's part. And a believer's act of publicly committing himself or herself to Christ and his people, thus uniting a believer and the church by marking him or her off from the world. That's what baptism shows. A person who has surrendered his or her life to the Lordship of Christ, which means that person is safe in the arms of Jesus. I use that term with our young children all the time, that we're not going to stop working until they're safe in the arms of Jesus. Some of you want your spouse to be in that situation tonight. 
Some of you want your other children. Some of you have adult children. You just so want to know and be assured that they're safe in the arms of Jesus. Well, being baptized, it shows that that's actually the case. What does baptism say? Well, baptism says this. I recognize my obligations under Christ. You're my Lord. What would you have me to do? You are my king. I know there are expectations you have of me. You are my sovereign. I will do what you'd have me to do. Lord, what is it? I recognize I have obligations under Christ. And there are obligations for the church. And there's obligations for the individual person. The church's obligations are summed up in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Often look to for people as to why they should get baptized. Now there's a connection there. But I want you to see that the first impetus of the Great Commission is not to individuals, but to the church. And in particular to us as under shepherds of Christ at the church. Great Commission begins like this. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain that Jesus had directed them. So you have in mind believers, disciples of Christ. This call is not to unbelieving, pre-believing children. This is to the leaders of the church, themselves disciples and those that they will minister to. The disciples went up to this mountain and when they, the disciples, saw him, saw Jesus, they worshiped. Even then, some of them doubted. But Jesus said to them these familiar words, to them, right, disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Here's your command. Go, therefore, disciples, and make disciples of all nations. That's what he's speaking to, right? So he's speaking to the disciples. You go and make other disciples of all nations. Baptizing them, baptizing the disciples that you've made, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching those new disciples who have been baptized, to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you, even to the end of the age. What do you see there? God expects his church to baptize his disciples. That is an obligation of Downsview Baptist Church to see that the members of this church who have unbaptized disciples in our midst, that we work and we pray and we take every effort that the disciples God has brought here, we would see that they are baptized. We don't just passively sit back and say, well, you know, if anybody would like to, just let us know. You know, if it's something that you're interested in, we'll let us know. But we can't push, we can't force, we can't, you know, it's just the wrong posture. And we've done that as churches over the years. We'll wait for someone to ask us. Now, if someone asks us, we're excited about that. And someone should ask us, of course they should. But our obligation is to look out there and go, all right, who has God brought here as his own, who he has made? Obviously, it's God who ultimately makes disciples. We're just involved, you say, but that we make sure they are baptized. Isn't this what it said? God expects his church to make disciples, to baptize those disciples, to teach those disciples, and to assure them that he's with these disciples even to the end of the age. And yes, there's an individual obligation. God expects his disciples to be baptized. But the disciples should expect to be baptized because the under shepherds of Christ are telling them so, exemplifying that, calling them to do it. Well, of course, if we're called the baptized disciples then the individual disciples also have the obligation to be sure that they are baptized. baptized. But you see, Oh, it's somewhat disconnected from sometimes how we see the Great Commission. That's not given precisely to unbaptized believers. It is given to baptized believers to those who are leading the church. Because, brothers and sisters, God does not expect his church to teach or assure unbaptized disciples. Now, let me just make it clear. Is there such a thing as an unbaptized disciple? Of course there is. Because you make disciples and then you baptize them. So there's a time that they're disciples and they're not yet baptized, right? So there are unbaptized disciples. The idea is it doesn't remain that way for very long. 
But there are unbaptized disciples. But what does he tell us to do with them? To teach them and to assure them? Okay, it doesn't matter if you're baptized. Let's talk about eschatology with you, which is a wonderful subject. Do we teach them all the details of other things? First, no, no, the order is, what do you do with an unbaptized disciple? You baptize them. That's what he calls us to do with them. That is priority number one. That we would, as a church, see that that is our obligation to baptize them. And I know, since there's such a thing as an unbaptized disciples, that the primary essential issue for a non-believing person is that they trust in the finished person and work of the Lord Jesus, the person and finished work of Christ. That's the primary, that is essential. You walk out of that meeting and you get hit by a car, you're going to heaven. Not the baptism doesn't save you. Not, you clearly know that's what we're saying. So baptism is rightly called a secondary issue. But one of the things that secondary does not mean is that it doesn't matter. Secondary doesn't mean unimportant. Non-essential does not mean unimportant. And yet somehow in our economy, friends, that's exactly what's happened. Non-essential does mean that's the message that unbelievers get or that young believers get. How has this happened? How did we get to the point that Jesus couldn't be more clear? If you love me, do what I called you to do. Ah, don't get to worry about that. How did we get there? You know, part of it's compassion, right? Part of it is desire. Part of it is passion. We want people to be right with Jesus. We so want them to be safe in the arms of Christ. We want our children and our grandchildren. We want our dear friends. We want our spouses. We want our fellow children. We want everybody to be okay. And we should. It's a good desire. But we start to shave off the edges of the commands of Christ and start to say that something doesn't matter, that Jesus says matters profoundly. So, either Jesus is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. Amen? Yeah, you're not so sure, are you? I'm not always sure either. Because it doesn't seem like Jesus is Lord of all, all the time. But be of good cheer, friends. You haven't made him the Lord of your life. Nobody crowns Jesus. That job's already been taken. His father has crowned him Lord of all. You haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life. You have recognized him as the Lord of your life. You've bowed your knee, and we are all together continually saying, Lord, help me to live a life of fuller and fuller allegiance to you, of more love for you, of deeper commitment towards you. And yet, friends, this is our goal. Jesus must be Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. That's what being baptized says. And how's baptism safe? This is his beautiful last point here. Because 1 Peter chapter 3 actually says that baptism saves by appealing to God. 1 Peter 3 verse 18 to 21. The apostle Peter lays out there about the occasion of the Noah and the flood and that the people who were outside the ark were not going to be saved. You had to be inside the ark in order to be saved. And that... That story of Noah picks up here in verse 21, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Oh, great. And every Roman Catholic in the world rejoices. Baptism saves you. Just be baptized as a pre-believing child. You're saved. No, no, no. Wait a minute. He's saying baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh. Not the act itself. How does baptism save you? It is an appeal to God. For what? An appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That means I have a right standing and I know it. That's what my conscience says because I'm trusting in the shed blood of our King, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Baptism says by, it's not just a passive act that comes on the other side of belief. It's actually an action. It appeals to God. 
It begs God. It's crying out to God. It's calling on the name of the Lord. Calling us to what? Save me. Save me. Save me. Don't let me go. Piper puts it so beautifully. He says that baptism is a symbolic expression of the heart's appeal to God. And the appeal is like this. I trust you to take me into Christ as Noah was taken into the ark to take me through the waters of death into new and everlasting life. Brothers and sisters, that is what happens. Baptism shows I've surrendered. Baptism says you are my sovereign. Baptism saves by asking God, save me, keep me, don't let me go. So here's the last two minutes of application. Who, brothers and sisters, are the proper recipients of baptism? Well, they are number one people who know who Jesus is. You must know who Jesus is. And knowing who Jesus is, you have asked him to save you. The devil knows who Jesus is, but he's not asked him to save him. So it's not enough to just know who Jesus is. You've got to ask him as the Savior to save you. And you've got to genuinely surrender to the one you've asked to save you. Genuinely surrender genuinely, not maturely. The recipients of baptism are ideally genuine, immature Christians, early in their Christianity. Genuine, to be sure, authentic believers, but very young and new at this. Then we teach everything he's commanded us, and then we assure them that Christ will be with them. Maturity follows obedience, just like blessing follows obedience. So here's the questions I leave with you. I leave with us as a church family. I leave with us as individuals. What is your life saying about your love for God? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and does not do them he it is who does not love me. What is your life saying about your love for God? Let's click the next one, Tim. Is it stuck? I got it here. What joy are you robbing yourself of by refusing to love Christ? Because refusing to obey him is refusing to love him. Do you now understand that baptism is a salvation issue? It really is an issue of our salvation. It cannot be ignored with no effect on our salvation. It's not the means, but it is the mark of salvation. So I ask you, friends, will you show his love for you by showing your love for him, by obeying his commands, and particularly by obeying his commands of baptism. And be assured, understand that salvation is never by works, but assurance always and only is by works. Our assurance that we are followers of Christ is if we follow. So hear the call of Christ. Come, follow me. I was given to the rich young ruler in three different gospels. Leave everything behind. Follow the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. I ask Heavenly Father that it would be your kind intention now to remind us of the diagnostic of love for Jesus. That is that we would obey Jesus' commands. We've applied it this day, dear God, to your call for us in baptism, that we would be immersed in water in confession of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I ask, dear God, for those who have yet to follow Christ's command in baptism, that you would cause them even now, dear God, to know the Holy Spirit conviction, that you would move their hearts and minds to commit themselves to show that they love Jesus, and move forward with baptism. 
For those of us, dear God, who have failed to understand baptism, I pray that you would make it clear, substantially clear to us today. I pray, Heavenly Father, that those of us who have not properly, for lack of understanding or because of our compassion or passion for others, that we would properly educate others as to what Jesus calls us to do. You have said in the very next chapter of this John's gospel that you have told us these things so that your joy would be in us and our joy would be full. Increase our joy, dear God. Fill us up with joy, even as we find ourselves showing our love for you and obeying joyfully your commandments. Cause us, I pray, dear God, to hear you in the commitment as we sing now. In Christ's name, amen. Please stand together, friends. Lord, 